Center, talking with M. F. Shirley. Mr. Shirley, please give me your name, spell your last name, tell us your birth date, and your current address. My name is Marion F. Shirley, S-H-I-R-L-E-Y. I I was born September 26, 1920. Uh, now, Mr. Shirley, would you like to tell us what you were doing just prior to World War II and how you entered the service? Well, I was a high school kid, and I didn't like high school, so I quit and went in the Navy. I passed high school examination to get in the Navy, and, which I'm glad of now. I sure didn't want no Army or Marine Corps. And... I went through Navy boot camp in Norfolk, Virginia, the fall of 1938. And I left uh, Norfolk on the USS Nitro, an ammunition ship, to join the fleet, the Pacific Fleet, which was in the Atlantic for maneuvers in 1939. I went to the USS Dale, DD-353, down in uh, the Virgin Islands. Then we were supposed to go on to New York's World's Fair, and President Roosevelt cut that short and sent us to the Pacific. And in October 1939, the destroyer that I was was on was detached to Hawaii, to Pearl Harbor, as one carrier, five light cruisers, and a flotilla are two of destroyers. And we was what you call a Hawaiian detachment. We were supposed to come back to the States in spring of 1940. The fleet came out. They kept all of us, So, uh, which disappointed us, not getting to come back to the States. And in, in 1941, they ordered all, uh, spring of 1941, they ordered all seamen first class and the destroyer's Pacific Fleet, Comdes Pack, to stand submarine examinations because they was building up a submarine fleet. They didn't want people off of big ships. They wanted them off of destroyers because they knew destroyers was rough duty and they could stand the duty aboard a submarine. Out of about 40 seamen first class on my destroyer, only three of us passed the examination. I was glad later on I didn't get it because that submarine duty was a lot worse than the destroyer duty even though the pay was better. Yeah. Well, I've made Gunner's Mate third class July the 1st, 1941, and they didn't want Gunner's Mates. They wanted seamen. So <clears throat> anyway, the destroyer I was on the Dale was one of two destroyers in November of 41 that had to go and meet the Natsu Maru or whatever it was coming from Japan with the envoys or consuls that was going to Washington for peace talks. We had to meet them about 200 miles west of Honolulu and they scored them into Honolulu and then they took a plane to, to Washington and those were the same two consuls that was in Washington talk, talking peace talks whenever, while they were bombing us. And before the war, just shortly before the war in 41, we were supposed to escort the Saratoga aircraft carrier back to the States, us and another destroyer. So they brought the Saratoga out of Pearl Harbor with a net tender, put a submarine net around the Saratoga, and us two destroyers out there patrolling, we picked up a Japanese submarine, submerged about 30 minutes after the Saratoga got out there. We were ordered to stay with the submarine and not do nothing about it unless he went in the restricted zone. He knew where that restricted zone was like we noted. it. He would go so close to it and he'd turn and go back. We was praying he would go in it because we wanted to death bomb him. Well, 
So we patrolled there, following him all that day because we knew it wasn't one of our submarines and Washington was, you know, in contact with us. So the next morning, all that night too, we followed him. The next morning, another destroyer come out of the harbor along with a net tender, took the net tender and the net up from the Saratoga and we were ordered to stay with the submarines. So we seen this destroyer, these two destroyers in the Saratoga going over the horizon. And about an hour later or less, the submarine headed for deep water, which is real deep off of Honolulu there. So the odd thing was we lost him out there. And it was a sand pan patrolling out there where we lost him, which was a coincidence too. And another coincidence, exactly 60 years later, one of our submarines, our submarines was operating out there and came up underneath this Japanese fishing boat visiting from Japan and sunk that Japanese fishing boat exactly 60 years later. I had written an article for the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association that was printed about that. Anyhow, when the attack took place there at Pearl Harbor, I was supposed to go ashore and meet two friends, which I left the night before. I didn't get overnight liberty. I was going to meet them the next morning. We had civilian clothes there. I didn't get to meet them, by the way, until later when they come back to the ship. Anyway, I'd cleaned up and put on all my fresh clothes except my Navy jumper. And a general alarm went off on the, Hon the Monahan, which was, had been on ready duty and came into the harbor and tied up on our port side. They had all their men aboard ship. We didn't have. So when that sound, a general alarm sounded off, I figured it was a drill. As I come out the hatch, the first thing I seen was a torpedo plane headed for the Utah. And another one followed it. And the Utah turned over and collapsed right behind us. Looked like a, the pilot was laughing because his uh, hatch was pushed back as he was flying in. Well, we made way. We got ammunition, and which took a while before we could start shooting. And uh, probably didn't do no good, no how. I didn't even see a plane shot down, really. So... Uh, even shorthanded we were, we uh, got the steam up and the Monaghan backed down first to one side and we backed down the other and we was following the Monaghan as she run down the harbor by the, uh, in between the USS Curtis aircraft tender and the uh, Utah. She was dropping depth charge on the midget submarine that had entered the harbor. We was almost running up on her depth charges. She was going so fast that she, where she got to the sugar cane field there, she run up into the coral, and we passed her going out. And when we got up there at the, the uh, channel going out, the officer's deck, which was one of three ensigns aboard the ship, he happened to be an Annapolis ensign, his name was Rydell, asked us, did we want to go to sea or stay in there? We want to go to sea. So uh, while we were going out, there was a, a bomb or something big was dropped right close to the hospital landing that hit within about, I'd say, five or ten yards right beside the ship. It didn't explode, but it throwed water on top of the ship and a shipmate of mine, I don't know who he was, he was pulling in the fall lines and the water drowned him from it and he just let go of the fall lines. The, it didn't explode and what it probably was, I understand they was dropping 16 inch armor piercing projectiles that, with tail fins on them that would being dropped on our battleships. I don't know whether it was armor-piercing shell or not. Whatever it was, it was heavy because it splashed water on her. So uh, we went on out to sea. During the attack, it happened so quick, and I was so mad 
like everybody else on there. I wasn't scared. A lot of guys said later on, they were scared, said, if you wasn't scared, you wasn't there. Well, I wasn't scared then. I was scared that night when it was over with because that night we had to lay to because we'd burn out a bearing and the uh, aircraft carrier and the rest of the fleet had run off and left us and we were by ourselves. And we got word that paratroopers are landing over there on their hollow little radios and everything, which it didn't happen, but uh, that was the word we got out there. So I was scared that night, but that morning I wasn't scared. But on the way out, that while we were on the way out, our B-17s was making a circle to land at Hickam Field, and we were ordered to shoot at all planes because all planes was enemy planes in the air. Well, when I seen them make their turn, me and some of the other guys in the gun crew said, those are our planes. Oh, no, the gun captain says, says they're all, everything in the air is enemy. So he, we fired at them. Our own plane, point blank range. Well, they made a turn and you could read the U.S. Army Air Corps on the, underneath the wings. I opened the gun trigger and had a live ammunition, a live five inch shell and powder in there. I opened that. I was the trigger man, the pointer on the gun. I opened the trigger. Of course, the gun captain didn't portray us in because he realized it was our plane. See, they were, we didn't know they was coming. So anyway, that round was fired later on in the South Pacific about two or three months later. It was still in the gun chamber. And where it was fired at, we were operating with a Lexington. And we were attacked by two waves of nine big twin-engine bombers. They, we was going to attack the, some of the places down there around New Guinea. And we got spotted by their patrol planes, and we were headed out. So they spent, sent these 18 planes up to attack us. Well, since I was... A pointer on the gun. I had a gun sight I looked through. So uh, this is something I'll remember all my life. The first wave of them, our fighter planes knocked them down. The second wave come in and they got in a little bit closer because we just had two fighter planes left and the Lexington sent them up. Well, one of them turned out to be Butch, Lieutenant Butch O'Hara. If you ever heard the name Butcher O'Hara? And he knocked him down. Well, his partner, his guns jammed, and he couldn't see it. Well, I could see him in the, through my gun sight. He would go up from the bottom and down from the top. What they said about him shooting those planes and naming that airport after him in Chicago, I seen it. He did it. I'll have to give him credit. He did it. Of course, he, we lost him later on in the war during the marijuana, Mariana turkey shoots. But uh, anyway, that's the way we operate with a Lexington. We had a tanker come down 5,000 miles to fuel us. The day before the tanker got down, we fueled off the heavy cruisers or fueled off the Lexington. Then, then the tanker had to fuel the heavy cruisers and the carrier. And after they got through fueling, then we topped off with more fuel. And the way we got some of our foods, the tanker brought down 100 pound crates of potatoes on, up on the deck underneath torpoles. The first time we went out on a patrol with a Lexington, they told us prepare for one week at sea. We went out and we stayed two weeks. That's before we started going to the South Pacific. So the old commissary steward laughed. The next time the, Sarat uh, the Lexington told us prepare for two weeks at sea, the chief commissary steward laughed. said, boys, I got it made this time. I took on 21 days food provisions. That was a big joke. We might have went out for two weeks. We didn't see land for 62 days. So we was eating Vienna sausage. A lot of them, I don't want to see a Vienna sausage. But uh, during our operation with a Lexington down there, 
The tanker, like I say, would come down about once a week of fuel us. So we got engine trouble, and the Lexington didn't want to keep us with them. So uh, when the destroyer come down with a tanker, the, the Lexington sent us back with a tanker on a zigzag course to, back to Pearl Harbor, 5,000 miles away. Well, we didn't have no problem. We either picked up a Jap submarine or, or a whale, one or the other. Anyway, we dropped depth charges. And we made it on to Pearl Harbor with a tanker, and so we were supposed to go to San Francisco uh, uh, Mare Island Navy Yard for 21 days. The destroyer and the tanker that was the exactly one week behind us came up through the same territory that we had came up through. It was the USS Sims, a destroyer, and the USS uh, Neosho, the the oiler. Well, the Japanese found them, sunk both of them. I don't think there's any survivor of them. We came through the same territory, but we didn't have no trouble. So we went on into Mare Island Navy Yard and for for 21 days. We got I got four days leave. So uh, anyway, one day there, when we was there two weeks, they tell us to prepare for sea in the morning. Not no week later, but in the morning. Well, they were still welding on the ship. Women welders is on there using these welding rods. So we didn't even pull up our lifelines until we cleared the harbor. We cleared the harbor. We didn't. We knew something was coming. Oh, the coral sea had already took place. So we knew something else was coming up. We didn't know what it was. We got out of the harbor. Then these old World War I battleships started coming out. They was up in Oakland Bay. And then a little old Jeep carried it, carried about six or eight planes. It came out, and we started heading north in the fog. We, they still don't tell us what's going to take place. What it was is a midway battle was coming off. And we were the backup force. They weren't sure they was going to Midway, so they were sending us to the Aleutians just in case the Japanese went to Aleutians. So the Midway battle took place. I missed that too. So the Midway battle took place. These battleships and that little old Jeep carrier turned around, went back to in the bay there in San Francisco. We went on to Pearl Harbor and after we got to Pearl Harbor, then they sent us to the South Pacific down there. And we were operating down around New Hebrides, and that was in the summer of 42 when the Marines landed in Guadalcanal. We had some merchant ships there that we were going to escort up there in case we needed them. Well, we stayed there for about a month, and they never did get them. Of course, we was taking a beating up there. We'd done lost three of our heavy cruisers, and the Australians had lost one. So uh, we left out of there to join the task force. So pretty sight I ever seen that morning. Got end up up there, and there was two task force together. One of them was the, had the Hornet in it, along with the uh, Washington. The other one had the uh, USS Wasp, along with the USS North Carolina in it. It was a pretty sight as most ships I'd seen together in a long time. Get off, I got off watch it about four o'clock. I go down below, as general alarm sounded, and all that big fleet there, a Japanese submarine had slipped in there and tor torpedoed the USS Wasp. And she was sitting there when I got to my gun crew gun station, she was sitting there exploding. So uh, we started taking the, getting the uh, Hornet away from there because we was short on aircraft carriers anyhow. And I'm looking back on the port quarter to, at the North Carolina. She got a torpedo in the right, uh, in the starboard bow, which is on the right side. She was running about 18 knots when she got 
torpedo. She kicked her speed up to about 28 or 29 knots, and we couldn't car hardly keep up with her because she could take a rough seas better than we could. We could outrun her on smooth seas, but not on rough seas. So we were elected to bring the North Carolina back to Pearl Harbor, us and another destroyer. That night, I'm scared again. We picked up some big ship that night on the radar. The ship don't want to identify itself or it don't know the identification, the IFF they called it. So the North Carolina, along with the other destroyers, backed, the other destroyer backed away from, away from us and we were ordered to challenge that big ship. So they challenged it on a, one of these uh, guns off the bridge, one of these lights off the bridge, one of the handguns. He wasn't an answer. So my gun was ordered to load a star shell in it, a five inch star shell. So we fired a star shell that lit up behind him and it looked like a big merchant ship, I guess it was. It was bigger than we were with all kind of booms and davits and everything on it. He got busy then and got on his yard arm and started signaling it. Well, he convinced our force that he was some ship out of Rangoon or somewhere out of India on the way to somewhere else. Well, in North Carolina and this other destroyer, where they was at, what the North Carolina was going to do, if we got shot at, then the North Carolina was going to sink them. I, that was a scary moment waiting for that, them to make up their mind to shoot or not to shoot. Anyway, that was one of the scary times I was ever in. So I went back to Pearl Harbor, and then I come back to the States. And November 42, I went to Vance Gunners Mate School in Washington because they had new guns coming out, 40 millimeter Beaufort's gun. So uh, then I went to a new destroyer going in commission and Staten Island, New York. The Navy lost mine and my buddy, he come off of the USS Arizona when it blew up. He was gunner's mate first and I was gunner's mate second at the time. So we get up Pier 92 in New York. They changed our orders. They had measles epidemic. We didn't care. We told them we'd already had measles. We didn't, but they said, well, you can take a shower, but that's all. You got to get out of here. They were supposed to send us aboard, right aboard the USS, Day, uh, USS Beale at Staten Island. Instead of that, they changed our order and sent us to receiving station, Hotel Lido, Lido, Long Beach, Long Island, and forgot us. Well, this new destroyer had green crew and everything since it's just going in commission. They needed somebody that had been to sea before. So we stayed out there two or three weeks, and finally one morning, he says, is Shirley Gunner's mate second and Keener's Gunner's mate first up here? Yeah, we here. Where y'all been? Like we'd been somewhere. So uh, we was in Jordan, you know. Even it snowed about that deep. Of course, we wasn't used to no snow. So uh, he said, the executive officer wants to see y'all down the basement, down the lobby. So we go down there and report it to him. As well as I remember, he's a full colonel. I met a commander. So anyway, he got on our case. He was going to give us a general court martial for being a AWOL. We, get, we heard enough of it. And we was feeling bad from being down in New York night before anyhow. So we proceeded to let him know that there wasn't nothing they could do for either one of us. He got even with us, so. He said, y'all have to be out of here before dinner today. We can leave right now because we our bags are packed. So we go up and get our bags and bring them down. They had a truck waiting for us downstairs, took us to the train station. That train took us down to New York. There's a, a tr truck down there waiting for us. The ship that we was going to had moved over to Brooklyn Navy Yard. That truck waited for us down there. We had to go across that Oak, uh, Brooklyn Bay there on the back of that truck. And neither one of us had seen winter in four years and they like froze us to death. We got aboard the ship and they was waiting for us on the ship when we got there. Gunner also wants to see you right now. Hadn't even set our bags down. So uh, the rest of it was training the crew from then until the spring of 43. 
spring of 43, I was glad when that destroyer went through the canal to get away from that cold North Atlantic. I was about to freeze to death. It got in the Pacific, and of course, we were still training crew. And we left uh, San Francisco, went up, going, going to take Kodiak, uh, take Kiska back from the Japs, get up there and bombard the beach and everything in the fog. The Japs had evacuated, there wasn't nothing there. So I, I was glad of that. Then we stayed in the Lucian Islands and up there, ended up there until the fall of 43. They sent us from a cold place to New Guinea. We operated down there for one year. And under general, under general directly under General MacArthur with a, with a, uh, 24th Division, I believe it was, and the 1st uh, Cavalry Division. Anyway, we operated so close with them, just going up, jumping, leapfrogging up the coast, and on to the Admiralty Islands. They started letting the soldiers go to sea with us on the destroyer. And the last bunch we got before we went to the Philippines, we got a great big bunch on there. Well, uh, Everything was like a honeymoon. We hadn't run into nothing. We'd bombarded a breach, but hadn't run into nothing. So finally, we hadn't got back to the Admiralty to let them off. <clears throat> and them soldiers had been giving us the blues. Boy, you sailors have got it made. And you're on a cruise down here. Nothing but a cruise. You got it made. So we went way on up the western part up there. We didn't have no air cover. We knew where we was at, but them soldiers didn't. There must have been about 30 of them on that destroyer I was on. So the next morning, we were praying for uh, cloud cover and rain. We had it that morning until about 10 o'clock. About 10 o'clock, the cloud cover broke, and the dive bombers got on us. Of course, the sound of them was worse than anything else, and they going into the dive. Well, one of our cruisers either got a, a small hit or near miss or something, and one of the destroyers got one, a bombing attack. Those soldiers changed their mind. Said, if I get back over yonder, that jungle's over yonder in the Admiralty Islands, you ain't going to get me out here. Say, you know, out here on this ocean, out there on this water, say, you stand out like a sore thumb. You ain't got no place to hide. So uh, that was the last bunch we got. Then we went on into the Philippines, and when we got there, everything was going along pretty smooth, and then the Japs started bringing the fleet, and we left the area where the troop transports was and started heading south. They ought not have told us this. They told us about 6 o'clock in the evening. So while we was heading south, says we were meeting the Jap fleet, going to meet them about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. I'd have rather waited until about 2 o'clock to find out. Anyhow, it gave you, there was two battleships and a bunch, plus 11 mother ships, I believe it was. Anyway, the, we lined up on each side. First, the PT boats attacked it. They stirred them up. They had, uh, the Japs already had their searchlights out when we had to attack behind them. The PT boats, I don't think, scored a torpedo hit on none of the ships. Well, when we went in, we went in 2,000 two yards this Japanese battleship. He didn't see us coming in because we were real thin going in. But you have to make your turn. 2,000 yards, that's one mile. That's point blank range. Well, we started heading out. We fired five, five of our 10 torpedoes. We started heading out, and we must have got out about 10, 10 or 15 miles. And they was playing their searchlights around, and then they, was, they fired a star shell that lit up on our starboard side, hung up there with a parachute for a good while. And then I seen him when he shot. And since I was a gun captain, I had phones on, but I didn't have nothing to do except tell my gun crew which we wouldn't fire no fire inch, five inch, no battleship. That would have been like shooting BB guns at him. So anyway, I seen him when he shot. 
he was such a long distance that I told my gun crew, I said, boys, we got it made. I says, he's not shooting at us. He's shooting at our battle, battleships up the bay. I knew he, they was up there sitting sideways. So I kept watching those shells going up. There was a bunch of them in the flight. and kept watching them going up. And finally, they was, act like they weren't moving. He was so far out there. Finally, it got up to the top of the trajectory, and they started down. Well, when they started down, they started picking up speed. I meant getting real fast and getting bigger, too. I said, boys, he ain't shooting too far past us. About that time, it hit me. I said, you know, sir, I got news for y'all. He ain't shooting at us. Those shells started coming down, and when they came down, they passed right over my head of my gun. I was on gun two in front of the bridge, and they hit on the, that was on from the starboard, starboard quarter. They hit on the port bow. They sound like freight trains when they come over my head. I was glad he didn't shoot the next time. That was too close, too close. You're talking about probably about 50 yards over shooting, and he was shooting up at about a 45 degree angle. So after that, it wasn't nothing but a side show. We watched our, well, I put it this way, I watched one of our light cruisers. Now, which one it was, I don't know, but I know it was one of the light cruisers of the Savannah, Boise, Helena. They had 15 inch, 6 inch guns on them. And he started pumping shot uh, salvos out, and he'd have about five salvos of shot in the air at the same time. One, one salvo would straddle the target, the next salvo looked like it hit over it, next one they hit short, and then the third one they straddled him again. And every time his salvo would hit that target, whatever it was, it looked like a forge in a old blacksmith shop. He would light up red from end to end. Well, after it was over with, the destroyers, some of them, it wasn't us, but some of the destroyers, oh, the USS Mississippi had their guns trained on us. We were in the wrong spot. And it took some convincing to tell them that we was, we was who we was. But after that was over with, the destroyers, some of them was ordered to pick up survivors. And that went on for a while. We wasn't one of them. And I understand, I don't know. Some of this is hearsay. The Admiral ordered to pick up survivors, and they kept saying they refused to come aboard. After a while, one of these our destroyers says, I have a submarine contact. And he went through these uh, survivors laying 750-pound depth charges. This other destroyer went across his wake laying them going the other way. So the Admiral, I understand, ordered uh, to take so many survivors, says, you know what to do with the rest, since they wouldn't come aboard. This I heard, this other was just something I heard. But this I heard, I heard machine gun fire. Well, where we was at so far south of the Lady Guff, the only machine gun fire we could be hearing was them machine gun those survivors in the water. That's my own impression. So uh, after that was over, we came back to the Navy Yard, stayed in the Navy Yard in December 44, January 45, was in the Bethlehem Steel Navy Yard, and we left there to go back to the Pacific, and we went back to uh, Philippines. My crew, my uh, uh, crew of destroyers, was ordered not to have liberty in a Lady Guff area. The commander's destroyers, Pacific Fleet, before we some of our crew members was so rowdy down there that uh, the admiral 
ordered the officers of the crew the USS Beagle DD-471 not to have Lady uh, uh, Liberty and the Lady Guff Air. I would have liked to have stole that cablegram off of the bill, a bulletin board. It says, from Comdes Pack to officer and crew the USS Dale DD-471. It says, from this date forward, the USS Dale USS Beale DD-471 will not be allowed Lady Liberty and Lady Guff Air. So we went back down there to g gather up to go to Okinawa. So uh, we had some beer aboard the ship to get around it. The skipper, pretty good fella. We could drink two cans of beer out of the ship's boat circling the ship. So we went up to Okinawa Got there Easter Sunday morning, April the 1st it was that year. Nothing to it. Landed and everything for about five days, nothing to it. Nothing but a cakewalk. About the fifth or sixth day, it hit full force. I think it sent about 300-something planes from Japan down there. And the kamikaze started. From that day forward, for about two months, it was trouble. And while we were up there, we shot down some planes. Uh, altogether, I don't know how many, but there at Iwo Shima, the day after we put some Marines aboard, Ernie Powell, the rider, had got killed that day there. We were out there patrolling with a little DE. We picked up two Japanese planes on the radar. Well, all planes was kamikazes regardless what they were. Well, I kept watching to see how high the gun was going because I knew when it was going to start firing. So I never did see the planes, but I was looking at the gun director. So uh, just before we started firing, I closed my gun door and latched it down. We started firing. We had two of uh, two Jap planes on the radar. We didn't have the Marine on the radar. We knocked down both Jap Japanese planes when they went into dive. And there's a Marine Major named Bur Major Bernard L. Long. He was on the tail of those two Japanese. Well, uh, our fighter pilots were so intense on what they was doing, they'd fly right through our anti-aircraft fire just like the Japanese did. We got him too. He bailed out. He had shrapnel in him, but he bailed out and this little DE out there picked him up. He was all right, but he had some shrapnel in him. I think he was a little mad at us though. But uh, I, while we was there, I seen uh, this uh, one destroyer I seen that it was off of Naha there on Okinawa. One suicide plane come in on one side and hit him amidship. Another suicide plane hit him on the other side. And you seen the guys that was shooting at him on the 20 millimeters there. When he hit, when it was over with, they just went nothing there where he was at. Uh, Offhand, I can't remember the name of the destroyer. I couldn't remember it later on. But uh, there at Okinawa, we was very fortunate. We didn't get hit. Well, we got suicided at one night there off of, off of Okinawa. And I'm up in the gun two in the front. And the plane hit so close to the ship that I told my gun crew it shook the gun metal around my, underneath my feet and everything. I said, boys, he hit us that time. It hit that so close when it exploded, but it didn't hit us. So uh, one time we was uh, patrolling up there, we got, uh, you know, uh, different stations there, plane guard stations. They'd send you like two or 300 miles above there. That radar picket station number one was the worst one. We didn't get that one, thank God. We got one up there real bad. So we was there 24 hours. We got relieved, and the destroyer relieved us. 
we're leaving to go back down to Okinawa. We're looking back in the western sky towards China, and we could see the destroyers, any aircraft fire above the horizon. They, he was already under attack from the sta same station we just left. Well, they banged him up, but they didn't sink him. They banged him up, though. Another time there at Okinawa, we was on ra a radar picket duty on this one station. Didn't nothing happen to us that night. We get relieved off of that one. The destroyer relieved us there. He got a suicide boat in the side of him. So uh, I was just fortunate in every place I was ever at. <laughs> yeah. And then I, they credited us with seven planes. I don't know how many we shot down. I know we got them too, but I don't know how many more. And they asked me, do I want to go on up to Japan for discharge, uh, or take my discharge. I said, I got enough points to get out. I want to go get out. So they transferred me off the ship over to Okinawa. And we was over there for about three or four weeks waiting for transport back to the States. And the transport I rode back to the States, Victor Mature, the movie actor, he was a chief master at arms. He was a Coast Guardman on the ship that I was come back to the States on. And I was dif discharged in October 7th, 1945 in Jacksonville. So I was real fortunate. I, I was glad to get out of it. <laughs> That's the whole story. Now what did you best play? What did you do? What did you do after you were discharged? What did I do? Yes. Just piddled around as much as I could. Yeah, I bet. And I've, I've been working in a liquor store now for 50, over 50 years. Great. What was Victor Mature like? Was he a nice person? Did, what was Victor Mature like? Big and flabby. I'll tell it like I think okay. it. Okay. Yeah. You know, they called him that great big hunk of man, you know, all them woman killer there in the way, uh, in uh, Hollywood, uh -huh. a big hunk of uh, flabber looked look to me like. Yeah. Of course, if he exercised, he might have been all right, I guess. I'd like to ask you, that is an amazing account. I'd like to ask you a little about growing up in Atlanta. At Atlanta, right before the war, when you were still in this, in this area, and also, did you have letters to and from people who lived here? What about the people back home? What was going on with the people back home, your family members? Well, uh, I had a kid brother come in the Navy in 43, but my three older brothers, they didn't have to go. Mm -hmm. The one just older than I was, he had multiple sclerosis. They didn't want him no how. And one was had got his eye put out at Alfreda, and he was... 4F, and the oldest one, he was a little bit too old. What about your parents? Did you write letters back and forth? Oh, yes. I, my mother, I wrote home, but she had cancer, and she died in 42 while I was over there. And uh, they couldn't convince her I was all right, even though they got letters from home. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, I've got a card at home. They gave us, when we come back into harbor that uh, December the 8th, it was a card you marked out what you didn't want to say. You couldn't add nothing to it. You say, I am well. I received your package. I will write later. It was a one-cent postcard. They saved it for me, and I, I've got it at home now. But uh, I wasn't able to write for about two weeks, I guess, but th they got that card later on. But I don't think they got it for a I think it took about a month to get here, but. What was life like in Atlanta when you were high school age and before you went on to the Navy? Well, times was hard then, and I had a paper route, downtown paper route. I delivered paper to Imperial Hotel, and and uh, right up Ivy Street it was then, and Atlanta Gas Light Company down on Cortland. But I lived in what they call Vine City now. Yes. I lived on Simpson Street, just uh -huh. just off of Northside Drive. Mm -hmm. 
And when I was in grammar school, I went to that grammar school just a block this side of where the dome is on Northside Drive. That was old Davis Street. There was a little little grammar school there then. Then junior high school, I went to Maddox Junior High and walked going and coming about three miles each way, rain and shine. Then when I went to high school, I went to Commercial High, which is down on Pryor Street. Well, I was good at math and I was good at bookkeeping, but I hated typing in shorthand. And after two years down there, I made up my mind I didn't want to go there no more. So I passed the examination for the Navy and I went to the Navy. <laughs> but, uh, oh, when I got in the Navy, they tried every way in the world to get me to be a yeoman. I said, ain't no way. <laughs> because I knew at that time, I could. they knew I could type. Uh -huh. I can't type now because I ain't typed in 60 years. Uh -huh. But I could type fairly well then. I wasn't too good with shorthand. Yeah. Now, what but, about rationing? Did you, did, had rationing begun before you went into service? Rationing? Oh, no, there wasn't no rationing. Okay. See, in 1938, there wasn't no rationing. Right. You sell everything you could. Rationing didn't take place till 41. I see. Sometime in 41. Right. I guess 42 probably because the war started December 41. But, uh, oh, when I was a kid, I'll tell you this. Now, this is something of history. Now, uh, there's some kids that lived on Edward Street just off of Northside Drive. Mm -hmm. They had some Fox Manufacturing Company that backs up over there on Marietta Street at Bankhead when Bankhead had a bridge across it. Someone over there was trying to invent a flying machine. Had wings and everything, and you crank it. Well, you know, uh, aviation was only 30 years old then. They stole that gimmick. It had about, uh, I guess, 12 or 15 inch, 15 foot wing spread to it. It had oil cloth in it. You crank these things and it flapped like a bird. It had a metal thing you step in and strap yourself in. The person that was trying to invent it was trying to invent a flying machine. These kids in the neighborhood went over there and stole that thing and brought it over there where we lived at and tore it up. They sure most, most certainly did. Yeah. What? what was your most memorable experience? Most memorable yeah, spirit. What do you think? What, is, what stands out the most as you look back at your Navy days? Uh, was it the people? I, I, I can't even think of one right now. So I mean, well, what, no. kind, what people do you remember the most? I, I can't really really think. You know, when I got back to the States to change ships in 42, they tried to get me to tell every way in the world about what happened at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And, well, they told in November 42, but in October when I come through, it hadn't come out then. And I had an uncle up here at Alfreda. He said, if I get you by myself, you'll tell me. But I didn't. No, we we couldn't talk about it because cause, uh, I knew better because I had a shipmate there in Honolulu one time who goes over there right after the war broke out when we'd come back from the South Pacific. He's over there in a bar running his mouth. This guy in the Navy uniform there happened to be an FBI man. That cured all that. I bet it did. That cured that. It yeah. made a lot of others of us Stop thinking, yeah. And I never did mail a letter except one that was censored. Some of the guys slipped and mailed letters ashore when they'd ship and get back to the States. I didn't. Mm -hmm. All my letters were censored. And they chopped, I never did put nothing in them, and they'd still chop them up. Mm -hmm. I know if a ship made a mine, I left a ship with him there, and I just hadn't met him a month before because a new ship there in, in Brooklyn Navy Yard. 
So he said, who'd you go to shore with? I said, by myself. He said, you mind if I go with you? He said, I don't know nobody on this ship. He happened to be a torpedo man. We, he wanted to stop up the Army and Navy's YMCA there on Sand Street. He had a handful of letters up there. He was going to mail them there, which he did. He wanted to stop there. And that was the only reason he wanted to stop, so he could mail those letters to keep them. I, I didn't ever tell on him or nothing like that, but uh, might have should have because, you know, regardless of how you look at it, that puts somebody else's life at jeopardy. His right. rules, that's, they make rules for a reason, yes. you know. Yes. They make rules for a reason. So, oh, by the way, that uh, ensign, Riddell, that took us out of Pearl Harbor, I think very highly of him, okay. really highly. Real highly of him, sure do. Mm-hmm. Now we had two other ensigns on there that had come out of college. They were good people too, but that guy had more, you know, Navy education on it. And he let us make up our own mind whether we could go out or not. Right. We've got almost 10 minutes left. So if you want to... Oh, one, I'll tell you one other thing that's funny. Good. We're down there operating in New Guinea. So the PT boats had been catching some fire from the shore, Japanese shore batteries. So they don't have nothing to protect themselves with but a, a single 40 millimeter, I believe, and some machine gun. So us and another destroyer was elected to go up there to rake over that uh, base. So we get up there and there's already pitch black night then probably about 10 o'clock at night. We pulled into a harbor, and it was just a small harbor with a small entrance. Deep water in there, though. And we started blasting the beach there, their base. So they come on. They thought they were being bombed by planes, and they turned a 36-inch searchlight towards the sky at planes. Well, you know what happened to that searchlight. We shot that rascal out in no time flat. It looked like a 40 watt light would be dropping water and going out. So while we're in there, a Japanese boat, about the size of one of our sub chasers, about 100 foot long, 150 foot long, starts heading to sea. And he started out. And he heading the, he's heading the same way we was. We're parting the bow towards the sea, and he heading that way. Well, my gun is up kind of high off the water. My gun barrel went down to 15 degrees below level, and we're shooting. I said, what in the devil are we shooting at? I stuck my head out the gun door. That's when I seen him. Our shells was going across, his, looked like sliding across his deck. Well, if it had been about... 20 foot to the left where his cunning tire was and we'd have hit him. But as far as I know, we didn't hit him. We had to stop firing because this other destroyer got in our way. It was that close in there. And as far as I know, that rascal got out of that harbor and he went on to Japan. <laughs> I could have hit, hit him with a rock or a potato or anything. He was that close to the ship. He was so close to the ship, my gun barrel on my gun wouldn't, uh, wouldn't come down low enough, I don't guess. Because our shells are going right, I could see my shells coming out of my gun barrel and see them slide, look like it's sliding across his deck. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you another question? Oh, another funny, funny, I got to tell. On the way back from, from uh, the Philippines there, we had left one guy that had been trying to get out of the Navy. Something was wrong with him. He was sick bay every morning, noon, and night. Finally, he convinced him it was his teeth. So he went aboard a destroyer tender there in the Admiralty Islands and to have his teeth pulled. We went on to the Philippines and landed there. And on the way back, on the way back to the States, we stopped there at the Admiralty Islands. And since I was a gunner's mate, they uh, sent some of us over there to draw some supplies for that, from that destroyer tender. And we seen him over there. His, his name I can't, his, can't remember it quite often right now, but I remember it later on. Anyway, we run into him, 
And we told him, we says, uh, fella, we're fixing to head for the States. This quick we clear the harbor, we're going to the States. No, you ain't going to. Now, just watch, because the ship boats come and pick us up, and we're going back to the ship, and we're going to the States. The Lord went and let it happen no other way. We went back to the ship. Ship picked up our boat. That destroyer I was on made a turn of that whole harbor. And where it went out, it passed right by that ship. And he's up on the fantail of it. And you could see his jaw drop. And all of us hollering at him and waving at him by. We did come back to the States, but we didn't, uh, we didn't know it until we cleared the harbor. But we convinced him we was going to come back to the States. <laughs> Oh, it was nice here in Atlanta. It was real nice, yeah. And uh, I am, I enjoyed my leaves here. See, there was, of course, there was some Navy up to Naval Air Station, but that's about all the Navy that you've seen. How are the civilians dealing with the war? Huh? How are the civilians doing? Oh, they treated us nice. But I'll tell you something. We were treated nice in the United States on, at most places in the United States. But we were treated like kings in Sydney, Australia. I went down there for two weeks twice. And some of the American servicemen took advantage of those people and run over them. I appreciated what they did for me down there. They really looked at us, looked after us. They were just as nice as they could be. And for man, woman, and child, it didn't make no difference. We were home down there. Well, if you stop to think about it, New Guinea went went a few miles from Australia. They was already bumming uh, Darwin, which was on the other side from Sydney. Now, is there anything you'd like to say to young people today? Huh? Is there anything you'd like to say to young people today about the country? Uh. Oh, that's, but I just wish them the best. It's, it's, a, it's a different situation now. We done stuck our foot in too many people's mouths now. I don't know what's going to take place. That being policeman for the whole world, I think it's just about backfiring. I think you're right. Just about backfiring. Yeah, I wished I'd have went on to finish to finish twenty years in it. I'd been the Navy had been paying me ever since nineteen fifty eight. And I, I really I really did really did love the Navy, to tell you the truth. But I, I stayed out more than ninety days and then after that I didn't went to work and I didn't worry about it no more. I hope I didn't sound too crazy. Oh, it was very nice. Thank you. Thank See ya. You.